Hey everyone, on this week's Trade of Black podcast, we talk about the ever emergence in NFTs and how the University of Michigan and their student players are now getting involved. The NCAA, it's a changing of the guard on how student athletes are potentially going to make money on their name, their image, and likeness. As well, we touch on GameStop. All charts indicate could this potentially go to $400 again? The overall share total will go from $300 million to a billion based on the recent announcement on a stock split. Is that a good or bad thing for investors? Find out now in our latest podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the Trade to Black podcast. I'm your host, Shad Dales. Before we get into the Trade to Black podcast here this week, as usual, all views of the Trade to Black podcast and the guests on this podcast are privy opinion. You should not treat any opinions expressed by us or our guests as investment advice. The views on this podcast are solely intended to be informational and are not investment advice. I wish we had a clock on that. I don't know how long that was, but I got to be getting close to beating Ryan. Uh, I think Ryan's probably got you by about six seconds. <laughs> I got work to do. Huh? Yeah, we got the, we, we we got that down pat over at the guaranteed money property. All right. Well, listen. Before we get in, obviously, big news this week. Uh, we signed a distribution with uh, Benzenga. So, all our viewers at Benzenga, hello. How are you? It's great to have you watching our Trade of Black podcast. So, to introduce the crew on my far right, Anthony Verrill, who's a millennial entrepreneur. Anthony, how are things? Uh, it's going well. It's going well. Good week. Crypto's pumping. I got a golf tournament right after we shoot this, and. Uh, then it's the weekend. There's an NFT conference in Miami the next week, um, so I'm pretty much going to be uh, going to be out of conference for the next seven days. Oh, that industry just continues to uh, explode. It's uh, wild in the middle. Yeah. yeah, it really is wild. Lead financial writer of the Dales Report, Benjamin A. Smith, joins us. Benjamin, how are things? I am doing well. Just watching the events in the market, historic Moore Act uh, vote uh, taking place today. So uh, it is. Uh, we're doing well. Yeah, big news, obviously. Stocks have ripped a little bit in the cannabis space. We talked about it earlier this week. Um, here's a question. Many people believe this bill is not going to pass, yet stocks are still ripping. So why do you think these stocks are performing well when most investors seem to think that this bill will not pass, Ben? That is a really, really good question. I'm trying to figure out the same thing. Uh, obviously, uh, especially with the Canadian LPs, uh, uh, stocks like Tilray, Canopy Growth, Hexo, Sundial, uh, all these uh, companies took off and gained anywhere between uh, 40 to 80 percent over the past week. Uh, now they're down a little bit on today on Friday, um, but uh, so there is some profit yep. taking taking place. But uh, you know, it's um, I don't know. It's hard to explain. I think the sentiment picked up. Obviously, uh, you know, Tilray, for example, is trending on Wall Street bets. Uh, so there's a, definitely some hype in play here. But when you actually think about it, uh, the Moore Act was already passed in December of 2020. Uh, so there's no real new ground being mm -hmm. broken here. And of course, Chuck Schumer, Schumer will introduce his COA Act. Uh, that's expected to take place uh, this month or possibly May. So obviously that's going to supersede anything that uh, comes out of Moore. And also we see actually rumblings of, of some uh, prominent Republicans uh, who... who uh, uh, may not be on board with the Moore Act, so it may not get the votes or as many votes that, or too many more votes than it received in, in December of 2020. So uh, your guess is as good yeah. as mine. I think it's just more momentum and shorts covering in, you know, in advance of the act. Uh, so uh, I don't think there's a lot of substance behind it, though. Anthony, your big uh, position in cannabis at one time. Uh, what's your thoughts on all this this week? I mean, I think it's the investors are finally starting to get smart. They're understanding that. I mean, the fundamentals are improving. Truly, you've just almost annualized a billion in revenue for 2021. Um, consolidations taking place. Columbia Care and Cresco um, with that with that deal. I mean, I think a lot of the moves in the Canadian LPs are warranted. Canopy Growth yeah. has that call option on acreage. Um, Tilray has uh, Sweetwater. Uh, brewing and, distrib and distribution in the States. Um, MedMen's got leverage to a Canadian LP um, through that deal that they did where they gobbled up the debt 
um, a couple of months back. And I mean, I think the writing's on the wall. The fundamentals are there, like we've said for the past four months. The sector's dislocated from the capital markets. And I mean, whether this legislation passes or not, maybe investors are finally getting smart and realizing that these companies are profitable, they're getting bigger, and it's not slowing down. I think the average I've seen on their earnings was they're up 80% year over year in revenue. Where the fuck else are you going to mm-hmm. get that in the market? Um, they might not keep mm-hmm. growing at that velocity from 2022 to 2023, but we're still going to get growth. We're still going to get consolidation, and the cannabis consumer is not going to slow down anytime soon. Okay, let me push yeah, back you know what I on found you there, Anthony. This week. Let me push Go back ahead. on you on there for a little bit because uh, you're right in, in insofar that the fundamentals are still strong when you look on aggregate, especially year over year. But this quarter, we did see a protracted slowdown in growth profiles of some of the tier one MSOs, uh, you know, companies like Jushi Holdings, for example, straight up and came out. And you, said consider, that you, consider, you consider you consider you consider Jushi you consider Jushi tier one. Well, it's definitely tier one in, 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 on the analyst charts. Now, it may not be a tier 1A, but it, it's certainly in the tier one uh, range for sure. But uh, they came out and said price compression was hurting the bottom line. So not to say that most of this is priced in. I agree that it is. But do you think that uh, that maybe traders are getting in a little bit or investors are getting in a little early now, uh, considering that Q1, uh, there still could be some softness because of high impl- inflation, and high producer price costs? I mean, I think there probably still will be softness, but I mean, you're never going to time the bottom. I mean, these things have gotten decimated. Um, I think it's probably time to get in. It's time to position some money around and it's time to get back in the game. I mean, look, look at all the companies. I mean, inflation obviously is God knows where that's going. I mean, we don't know where the rate hikes are going to go. So money's definitely going to get cheaper. Uh, money's going to get more expensive. But if anything, I mean, these companies are profitable. They're sitting on cash reserves and they're going to be able to grow yep. even in a high, a high rate environment where capital gets more expensive. Yeah, I learned this week that there's like a flower shortage, which is explaining why a lot of these uh, companies have had lighter quarters uh, recently. But that surprises me, doesn't it? A fl- uh, which companies are you talking about in particular? Well, like, for example, some of the reports that came out uh, on earnings recently, obviously, with Cureleaf, Leaf, they're a little bit lighter than what uh, a lot of estimates were predicted. Cresco, obviously, as well. But, you know, earlier this week in a previous podcast, we were talking about the reasons being, and it was basically a flower shortage across the board from a lot of industries, which, you know, surprised us a little bit as to why uh, that was happening. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 to be honest, I haven't paid attention enough to that topic. I would assume that that flower shortage is either a function of consumer demand is outpacing um, the, the fact that they're cultivating or they pared down cultivating a little bit due to inflationary pressures and the cost of goods going up to, to, to combat that to a degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of that had to well, do with the price we look compression at inflation. In, in the market. Um, yeah. Straight up price compression, we talked about in October and November, Pablo Zuanich uh, piggybacking off his research. Uh, wholesale prices went down about 15% in Q4. Uh, so that reflected uh, in the dispensaries at the dispensary level with, with retail pricing going down as well. So although like unit sales yeah. were probably flat to up, up a little bit yeah. because the pricing came down. The revenue profile was sort of disappointing, and a, a couple, uh, you know, MSOs uh, lowered their full year guidance. But a lot of this is probably pricing. Mm-hmm. I agree with Anthony. You never get a time the bottom, right? So no, never. Yeah, yeah. Well, this week Wall Street wrapped up Q1, and um, it's probably a quarter that we'd uh, very likely and very happily want to just close the door and move on with. Yeah. But. Um, it was the worst quarter since the first three months of 2020, which obviously included the COVID pandemic lows in late March of that year. Overall for Q1, the Dow and S&P 500 closed 4.5% and 4.9% respectively. The NASDAQ lost 9, 9.1%. And we haven't even discussed, obviously, the start of uh, rate hiking, which is now here to obviously help calm inflation. So, Ben, if you're an investor and you're looking right now, and again, this is not investment advice, but uh, what what can Americans expect when it comes to overall inflation and obviously rate hikes uh, as we forecast things over the next one to two quarters? That is a very good question. Uh, I know the dots on the Federal Reserve chart that they use uh, signal you know, perhaps seven or eight rate hikes this year. Goldman Sachs came out with research recently and expected uh, two 50 basis point rate hikes for this year as well. Um, So, you know, it's a very tricky situation in in terms of inflation. Obviously, that's something they have to tackle. It's at 40 year highs right now. And the Russia situation uh, obviously doesn't help help because um, a lot of their commodities are sort of shut off from the 
the global trade cycle now. So things like potash, things like fertilizers, uh, Oh, yeah. is not going to help, you know, food commodities. Uh, Russian oil is obviously being sanctioned in North America and uh, they don't have access to that. So that is spiked energy prices. So um, overall in the market, I'm a little bit cautious right now because we have this huge bounce in the, in the NASDAQ and, and the S&P. It went up to pretty close to all time highs, maybe, you know, five or 6% under. So considering how high inflation is and considering uh, the big move that we've seen recently, um, I would stay a little bit defensive and see how it all plays out. Because as you said, you know, the rate hiking cycle has just begun with 25 basis points uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that's only just begun. I, I think they're going to have to do something to tackle inflation and to raise rates. And that's uh, obviously uh, not generally good for the market. Are we on the verge of a recession, Anthony? I mean, if you've watched CNBC this week, all everybody's been talking about is how the yield curve inverted on Monday or Tuesday, and then that forecasts a recession historically. Um, they're saying that there could be six months of runway to where the numbers increase, or there could be 18 months of the runway where the numbers mm -hmm. increase leading into a recession. I mean, if it's one thing that I've, that I've definitely established, in my opinion, of from what I've seen on TV, no one knows what the fuck is going on. I mean, we just probably, w I mean, we just went through probably the most disruptive event in human history. The world shut down mm -hmm. for, for, mm -hmm. for, for, an, for an extended period of time. Not only that, but we printed an unprecedented amount of money. I mean, I think it's going to be choppy. I think there's going to be rough waters ahead, a full-blown recession. I hope not. I wouldn't be surprised if the market goes down to a degree here in, in the next few quarters. But I mean, pr productivity is not slowing down. Innovation is not slowing down. And I mean, unless there's some sort of financial bubble looming that's going to pop, I mean, I don't see some sort of existential crisis to the market like what happened in 2008. That being said, real estate's been on a tear. And I, and I know people that are currently still looking to buy real estate. And rates right now have gone up from about 3 to 45 to 4.8. So, I mean, as that money gets more expensive, you're probably going to see less people buying real estate. And as a function of that, if the real estate market goes down, everything else will probably follow. Um, and I mean, I, what I'd watch is I watch Toll Brothers stock. Historically, when Toll Brothers stock rolls over, you can expect the housing market to kind of take a skid right after that. And it's been on the decline for the past couple of weeks to months. Yeah, and, and that hits the it's crazy people with everybody with a variable rate too, right? That hits uh, you know, yeah. if you have a variable rate and you're you're, you're you think you're you're paying like two point five percent on your mortgage, and all of a sudden it's at three point seven five percent, that's going to affect the whole yeah. curve of consumer demand, right? If you're oh yeah, you know, yeah. mortgage payments are two thousand a month, and now they're all of a sudden twenty eight hundred dollars a month or twenty six hundred dollars a month, you'll have less money to go ahead and spend the economy. So uh, the higher mortgage rates 100%. go, obviously that has a huge impact on consumer spending. 100%. The challenge, though, like when we focus on the U.S. and even up in Canada and North America, it's an inventory issue. So as much as rates are going up, um, I don't know how the housing market doesn't stay hot if there's an inventory issue. In Canada, it's an aging country. You've got immigration fast forwarding as much as three to 400 percent. And quite honestly, inventory has not picked up in over the quite case of 30 years. So I don't see that slowing down any time. And it's very... Um, uh, as far as the increase of property value, it's been very conservative over the course of 15 to 20 years. But conservative even speaking to very, I would, I would, yes, it's gone up quite a bit. The real, but it hasn't been a the real estate in like the real estate in Toronto and Vancouver make the United States look cheap. But I'm saying over the court, but look at real estate value. Let's say in New York City. I mean, my buddy just bought an apartment in Vancouver that was like 1,700 square feet. I think he paid 3.8 million Canadian. A hundred percent. But what I'm saying is, is that that's, when you look over the trajectory of 20 years, you've seen a steady increase. It hasn't been like a okay. huge spike, like so the it's not, real estate bubble. Got it. Got it. Got it. But yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, the price yeah. is shit. The stuff in Vancouver is, uh, is, is a marvel in itself. It makes, it's up there with Hong Kong and Singapore. Yeah. 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 You should see but at the same time too. Yeah, where? I mean, sorry. Uh, sorry. Chad. <laughs> yeah. Where? A quick example with Oshawa, there's a, you know, there's like an 800 square foot house. It's, not a, even suburban a, area of, uh, it's a suburban area of Toronto. Yeah. Subur sorry. It's a suburban oh, area yeah, of Toronto. Yeah. Traditionally I known that, as... I, I, I saw that meme. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that meme oh, online. Did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I follow we're six talking buzz. like 1.5ers, I, I, you know? Yeah. yeah I, I stay posted to Six Buzz to get all my, uh, all, all my Canadian Say hi to our Six Buzz friends yeah, in yeah, Toronto. Yeah. It's great. Um, Let's, you know, as we talk about the emergence of NFTs, the digital space, uh, let's talk GameStop. Uh, Bull Flags was created between March 18th and is ongoing on Thursday with the poll form between March 18th and March 29th. And the flag forming over the days that have followed 
The measured move, if the pattern is recognized, some believe is 150%, which indicates GameStop could be trading back up towards $400. Is that very reckless to think that way, Anthony? Yeah, I think it's a stupid headline. I think it's a stupid article. Um, I mean, if you can, if you think that 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 GameStop can retrace the 400, sure, it's not going to be on fundamentals. I mean, they announced an NFT marketplace based on Immutable X. That was the best headline that they've probably had in the past four months. Immutable X ripped, GameStop ripped, and then Immutable X, yeah. I got absolutely roasted on um, with it coming back down. I think it corrected about 60% um, to the downside. I mean, I think GameStop's valuable in an environment where you see blockchain gaming coming online, where you see esports coming online. But again, they're not a publisher. They're just a front-end marketplace. In esports and in the video game world, the guys that are going to be making yeah. the real money are the publishers and the guys that are actually putting these ecosystems into motion and then sitting back and collecting the money um, in the form of royalties, in the form of NFTs, in the form of, of, of playable game pieces. Like there's a huge ecosystem that needs to be built. They're just one piece of it. I don't really see how they fit into the equation. And if they launch a pure play NFT marketplace to compete with the likes of looks rare or open sea, I would sell the stock and run for the Hills. Um, I mean, yeah. I don't know why these, these GME, like, uh, at, the, the, they're, they're crazy. They're like, they're, they're like fringe lunatics to a, to a degree. I mean, it's like betting on something that you want to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. And they thoroughly expect yeah. it to happen. And the CEO that's currently installed there and, and the company as a whole, they haven't really done much on the execution side to warrant this move to the upside. When you say publishers and the publishers that are make money, educate some of our viewers and who those companies are. So Activision Blizzard, that was, for me, that was a genius uh, acquisition by Microsoft. Um, if you want to really look at the metaverse and you want to see what's the oldest metaverse or one of the oldest metaverses in existence that you could pop in blockchain and really bring some life to invigorating it through Web3, it's World of Warcraft. It's been around for decades. It's got a mature user base. It's already got economies that are built in. It's got a game mm -hmm. engine that is invaluable. Blizzard mm -hmm. has a, these publishers. They have a game engine, and then that basically powers all of the titles. And they just build on the aesthetics and the mechanics um, in the game. Activision Blizzard owns that. Um, there's also Take-Two. There's also Riot Games. There's also Ubisoft. Um, there's yeah. plenty of well-advanced game publishers out there, but GME sure as hell isn't one of them. And I'm really curious to see actually what they do from a strategy perspective to drive revenue, because as of right now, it's not really much. Yeah. Well, Ben, uh, the stock soared this week, GameStop, uh, jumping as much as 15% based on news of the video game retailer announcing plans for a stock split. Uh, GameStop said it will seek approval at its next shareholder meeting for an increase in the number of Class A common stock from 300 million to 1 billion shares to partly conduct a split in the form of a stock dividend. So if you're a shareholder of this company, what's your thoughts based off of that? Well, you can see me shaking my head a little <laughs> bit because, uh, yeah, it had a big after hours uh, move after yeah. that, uh, news was announced. I think it was like 25 to 30 percent in that range. And uh, I always shake my head when I see these kind of things because it reminds me back of my trading days, uh, full-time trading days uh, in the NASDAQ bubble, in the, in the tech bubble. And you would see the same sort of oh, thing. Yeah. You know, Apple would split. All of a sudden, after hours, it would go up 30%, 20%. I mean, this was all commonplace. And this reminds me and of the then, same thing because when you look at it from a fundamental yeah. point yeah. of view, and it shouldn't be because nothing about GameStop is fundamental at this point. But if you do, no. uh, there's no value actually added. I mean, the whole theory behind it is that with a lower price, then more retail investors can come in because the, the price per the of each share is that, you know two ugh. or three times lower, whatever the amount they're stock splitting for. So I mean, yeah, I understand why you could open your up, open itself up to more investors, but from a fundamental point of view, there's no value being added. It's the same company no. that it was before, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you're going to add like I don't know, twenty billion in in market cap overnight just on that or whatever it is, hundred billion. I mean, it makes no sense mm -hmm. to me. So I stay away from these type of plays. Uh, I'm more focused on like price point, uh, preservation of capital, upside risk. So this is not really my cup of tea. But when I see that, I'm just like, okay, if, if investors want to partake in that, then go at it. But uh, you know, I'm not buying that buying that ramp at all. Yeah, the, the, the fact that that's an actual. Yeah, I mean, the fact that that's an actual narrative that a company would want to split its stock to make it cheaper per share, but not from a market cap weighted basis to bring more suckers into your fucking share your shareholder <laughs> list is borderline criminal. I mean, but that is the mechanics and that is the psychology of play here. Like, yeah. there's no other justification for it. 
I mean, it's to teach their own. I've blindly, I, I used to blindly believe in some stocks. Um, I've watched millions of dollars disappear on paper, um, making those mistakes. I'll never make those mistakes again. Um, if the fundamentals aren't there, if the management team's not there, if the execution's not there, you're not going to just have the stock appreciate on hopes and dreams. You're going to wind up losing yeah. net net go, uh, always. And just to add one more thing, I'm also oh. a little bit biased because I know GameStop has changed and they're into the metaverse and all these like new Web.30 things. But I still see the GameStop near my house where like retail, where they sell games and like yeah, PlayStation yeah. games and things like that. So I personally still, I have a bias. I view them still as like a retail game player. And then I see this valuation. They are. They are. Well, yeah, that's their they, core business, right? I know they're they, getting they, into they, new they stuff, are. But I, yeah, they, they announced an NFT marketplace. It's not live. There's no beta. Mm -hmm. There's no signups. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, Coinbase is going into the NFT business. FTX is going into the NFT business. Good yeah. fucking luck. You're never going to compete yeah. with any of those guys. Yeah. Let's focus now on uh, the continued emergence of NFTs and news out of Ann Arbor as the University of Michigan are going to be partnering in the new NIL venture. Um, Blockpack is a company that creates NFT marketplaces and plans to link them with college sports fans. Will make the digital tokens and facilitate the resulting auction, according to a release from the company. So players will provide the images themselves. So clearly, uh, we're starting to see a change of the guard, don't you think, Anthony? In the NCAA, where players are now getting the opportunity, your student athletes are getting the opportunity of making money based on their names, image, and likeness. Is this is where we're headed? Oh, I think it's great, and I think it's long overdue. I mean, when you look at the conversion rate from collegiate athletes into the pros, it's very small. And I mean, a lot of these kids, like they deserve to make some sort of money while they're in school. So they at least have a nest egg and they have a foundation that's Agreed. representative of the amount of money they made the university once they get out of school. Like pay the kids whatever they want. Let them market. Let them use their likeness. Let them be able to let, let them be able to juice the opportunity at hand. I mean, granted, they're getting a free education. They're getting free room and board. I mean, you could argue that that's invaluable, but they're making – especially the majors. They're making millions and millions and millions of dollars for these, for these uh, schools, and they should be able to at least partake in some of the profits due to their likeness and due to their exposure. So, I mean, I'm all for it, whether it's an, NF, whether it's an NIL agreement um, with an NFT company, whether it's a trading card company, whether it's a car dealership. If if, mm -hmm. if if a quarterback for Alabama wants to go out there and sell 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 and make a couple million dollars off of his off of his name image, image and likeness and those sponsors are willing to pay him, <laughs> let him let him go do it. There is nothing wrong with it, and he's taking advantage of the situation that they've worked so hard to put themselves in because there's no guarantee that they're going to excel at the next level. And the Fab Five in Michigan, they would have loved this they'd back in the early nineties. Yeah, they'd be they'd be they <laughs> would they? they would have been rich. I mean, so would Shaq. Yeah. Imagine if LeBron, LeBron probably would have made twenty million dollars in high school if I if, know. If, if Nike could have got their claws into him um, in high yeah. school. Um, Dwayne yeah. Wade, Melo, like these guys would have been Zion, like these guys would have all yeah. been Nike athletes their freshman year. Yeah. Is it going in that direction? And what's your take on it all? Is it going yeah. in that direction? Because yeah, yeah, I know yeah. college I mean, now they pay players, don't they? They do. They, 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 they pay players. Um, there's also this new league that came out called the OTE that is basically allowing players to go play semi-pro versus college or the, D, or the G League. And they're paying yeah. each player $100,000 uh, flat salary to play in the league. The problem is, is going into college, you really do play against high competition. If they can't get that high competition into the OTE, yes. then there's, then I argue you you can argue that your talents are going to be wasted because that step up to the pros. You need to get your ass beat in college or be able to excel well past your peers in college to have any chance in hell. Once you get to the NBA. It's like when Wayne Gretzky and John Candy went after rocket Ishmael from Notre Dame, <laughs> brought him up to the CFL. Yeah. That's way yeah. back in the day. But yeah. yeah, that's, he was arguably the best college football player that yeah. we've seen in recent memory. And then after that, it was just like when he made it back to the NFL, he was a role third receiver, but didn't really yeah. uh, equate to much of anything. Um, last thing I wanted to bring up to you guys, and it's been a couple of weeks since we talked about psychedelics, but we talked about a lot of mergers, acquisitions, and consolidation that will be done this year in the industry. And looks like one of the first companies, well, indeed it happened, that was, uh, I guess, the end result of one of these casualties of the industry was MindCure that seized operations a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, lots of rumors about other companies that potentially could be coming to the fruition, too, of, like, you know, seizing operations this year. 
this industry right now, uh, it, it, are you shocked as to how fast uh, the, 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 I guess the switch has been flipped, uh, Ben, with regards to how hot it was, let's say, tw- uh, 12 months ago, and now it's just, it's dead. Uh, I, I am, it, yeah, I'm mostly not surprised, actually, um, just because I know how long cycle the biotech uh industry is especially junior biotech and obviously a lot of these companies were not really you know capitalized for the long term right it was more of a situation where they're going to fund you know they have enough money to fund operations for two or three quarters and they'll have to raise and then they can keep going for another two or three quarters and have to raise so it's almost like the mining industry in a way uh, of a junior explorer where you know you dig holes you get good assays and then you have to raise money again to get the next hole right and then the next hole so um you know, if you're not, if your name is not a tie, if you're not uh, Compass or MindMed, right, that are funded for six to eight quarters out, um, unfortunately, a lot of these companies weren't. And uh, yeah. in the case of MindCure, yeah. they got into a situation where they still have, you know, I think like 10 or $11 million. So they're not going anywhere, but they sort of see the writing on the wall. They see what their future cash flow is going to be. And then they're like, okay, wait. We don't want to raise down at, you know, 12 cents or 10 cents a share. We got to preserve our capital right now. And, you know, shut all spending that's not necessary and just, you know, try to execute with what we have. So I think that's what you're seeing in the industry. So I'm not surprised. Uh, perhaps uh, I'm a little bit surprised that we haven't seen any sort of material bounce in the sector. It's just been straight down for, you know, four or five quarters. But um, that's just a byproduct of, you know, the industry and not being capitalized, uh, most of it anyway, unless you're part of the big four or five. Yeah, Anthony. Again, the switch has definitely been flipped. It's yeah. like we're, we're we're like there is obviously big upside to this industry. I don't want to say it's dead, but really, what you're starting to see now is a handful of companies probably coming to the forefront, as Ben said, that are obviously cashed up. So, if you're an investor in this space um, and still interested in it, what are your thoughts on it all? I'm not touching any names in this space other than Compass Pathways and Atai. Um, I yeah. think that a lot of people had a lot of great ideas and are now coming out to find that those ideas are not defensible and those ideas are not patentable. And and now they're finding out those ideas are not investable. Um, I think that's Mm -hmm. going to still be a theme in this sector. Um, I don't think this is a junior company sector. This is whoever has a war chest of cash, IP, as well as Maverick, Rockstar, Human Capital, they're going to win. Those are a tying compass. Mm -hmm. Um, They've got They've got an, an institutional backing that will probably come back to the well if the companies need it, as long as there's efficacy and as long as there's research being driven. Some of the smaller guys, sure, they might have some revolutionary um, IP or they might have some really great ideas in theory, but I don't think they're going to get the chance to have those ideas fleshed out into um, into their execution phase. The capital's just not there. I mean, the capital markets dried up at an inflection point that really kind of screwed the sector. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of the, uh, the cases of mind care. Um, wouldn't be surprised if it happens to probably 75 to 80% of the sector. And then those companies are going to be dissected for spare parts. If there's IP, yep. if there's something that's defensible, I'm sure a tying compass will come pick it up for pennies on the dollar. They're, they're, they're going to just keep gobbling and gobbling and gobbling. But I don't think it bodes yep. well for, for, like I said, 75 to 80% of the psychedelic sector right now, especially ones that are going to need to go back to the well for cash because it ain't there. Yeah, no, I just want to. Uh, what add do you one think, thing. viewers that are watching this? So I just ahead, want to add one thing here too to what Anthony said, and I have to give kudos to a company like MindCure because they're one of the juniors out there with in the uh, you know fifty to seventy million market cap range, and they had the IP. Just to piggyback on what Anthony said, if you have yeah. the IP, a company like Ots- Otsuka Pharmaceuticals came in, a big uh, multinational uh, based out of Japan, and they basically gave them five million dollars cash. And they funded their whole phase one of operations, right? They're paying for that whole trial, right? So if that is successful, that gets them to phase two. And then obviously they'll be able to command uh, uh, a better valuation once they get to that stage. So I, I'm, you know, hopefully we can get a few more of these type of deals where they're sort of non-dilutive, where, uh, you know, the acquiring party can get uh, a percentage of future revenues based on the drug or compound that comes out. And then they don't have to dilute as much, and then they're capitalized at least to the next round of funding. So we we yep. did see that with mindset. I'm a little surprised that maybe this sort of deal hasn't happened yet in the sector this year, but there's, there's still a long way to go. So hopefully we see more yeah. of these type of deals, and then you'll see you'll see some of these juniors survive. 
you said off the top mind cure, but you meant mindset pharma, correct? Oh, I'm sorry, mindset pharma. Yes, mindset pharma is yeah. Yeah, with the deal yeah. with Otsuka. Makes sense. So you, the viewer that are watching this, we'd love to get your feedback. Leave a comment below on what you think the psychedelic industry, where it is right now and where you think it's going. And don't forget to click on that bell for notifications and subscribe to our channel. Gents, I appreciate you checking in this week. Before you go, we got a big blue Final Four weekend coming up. Can you believe Duke and North Carolina are playing for the first time in the Final Four? Yep. I was not aware of that. No. Like these two no, 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 no. The first time in the tournament. First time in the tournament, is the, it? North Carolina and Duke have never played each other in the NCAA tournament. Wow. I thought it was the Final Four. It's no. the first time ever in the first tournament. First time ever in the tournament. And also, wow. also you got to remember that UNC gave Duke an absolute ass beating in Cameron Indoor yeah. on Coach K's yeah. last game of the final season. So yeah. Duke, I don't care Duke, what Duke owes them one. You are, yeah. Duke, Duke owes them one, but I think UNC is going to blow the doors off of them again. I said this to you a couple of weeks ago in round one when we were in Vegas. You can never ever underestimate these storied franchises or universities no. that have a track record of even if they're a ten seed. You, you just you can't. You know, uh, overlook you know a Tar Heel team that, quite honestly, there was a guy that actually put a ten thousand dollar bet down while we were in Vegas to have St. Peter's reach the Final Four, and he would have won a hundred million bucks. Hundred million, Poor guy. Hundred million, hundred million. Yes, if they would have won, it would have won two hundred and fifty million because it was a two twenty five thousand yeah, so to one odds. Jesus. That's crazy. That's crazy. I had wow. to click that in, and I'm like, what? Anyways, crazy yeah, to say the nuts. least. Okay, so here, real quick, who's your pick? Who's winning it all? Anthony? I've got I've got Kansas UNC in the championship, and then okay. I've got UNC winning the tournament. Wow. Okay. So an eight seed's bringing it home. Yeah. Ben, who you got? I'm going to echo what Anthony said because uh, I haven't actually been following the, the tournament all that closely. I, I must be honest. But I want to ask you too, uh, you two guys, before we leave, is Coach K? This is his last year, correct? And if this so, is, year, is yeah. Coach K the is he the best college coach? basketball coach in the history of the NCAA. He's the best college coach post John Wooden. Yeah, I will say. I don't know John was before my time, but yeah. let's face it. How many championships? I think they won five. Uh, wait, Coach K or John Wooden? Yeah. Uh, well, John Wooden's got eight or nine. John Wooden, I think, coach has K. 10. He has like 10 or 12 at UCLA. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, coach K is the best. Co- coach K is the best coach in the postmodern era. Also, yeah. I would take into consideration that those seeds – like the the eights and the ones and the twos, they didn't matter as of two rounds ago. Those matter in the first two weeks. Yeah. As of right now, all those teams have a one next to their name because they're in the final four. Yeah, yeah. Only fitting that Coach K in his last tournament ever I, plays North Carolina. It's great. Yeah, it's a great story. I mean, I, I I I obviously just called UNC to win, but it would not surprise me if somehow Duke just wills themselves to win this damn tournament. Yeah, yeah. That's my pick. He rides off into the sunset, yeah. rightfully so. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how many Final Fours in addition to those five oh. championships that he's had, but it's too many. You got to count that on a couple of different hands, that's for sure. Too many. Um, enjoy your round of golf, Anthony. Oh, well. Ben, we'll continue to watch the markets closely, and uh, I'll chat with you guys early next week. Talk soon, guys. All right, thanks, guys. All right, take care. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. We appreciate you giving this video a thumbs up. We also value your feedback, so leave a comment below. And if you like what we do, then share this video on your socials. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and tap on that bell to receive notifications for all future videos that we post. Thanks for watching.